Viaggi per rivivere il tuo passato? Viaggi per ritrovare il tuo futuro? L'altrove è uno specchio in negativo. Il viaggiatore riconosce il poco che è suo scoprendo il molto che non ha avuto e non avrà. Questa rubrica è stata ideata con l'intento di raccogliere le testimonianze di quegli allenatori europei che per affermarsi sono stati costretti tramite un processo osmotico ad allontanarsi da casa, mettendo in gioco il proprio equilibrio di persona all'inizio, in nome del calcio. Hi everyone, we have uh, the opportunity to have in our YouTube channel uh, the leading expertise in MLS because uh, we know very well Thomas Rongen as seen with uh, his highs, the evolution and the rise of the uh, American football movement. But uh, I wouldn't uh, forget your origins because you are Netherlands, Dutch, and uh, you, you arrived in America in 1979 and you stay here until today. So uh, do you consider uh, an acquired American citizens now? Yes, I have two passports. My Dutch Netherlands citizenship and my US uh, citizenship uh, for 10 years now as well. So I'm a, I go to Europe, I use my European passport. I go to other countries where they, where they like the US, I use my US passport. So I'm a, a well traveled Dutchman that came here at a very young age, thank you, in 1979 to be coached by the great Rinus Meagles and to play with my childhood hero, uh, Johan, Johan Cruyff. So wonderful experience. So was my experience in 94, because my favorite team in Italy is AC Milan because of the Dutch influences, obviously, of Rijkaard, Van Basten and, and, and Gulit and Saki 442, you know. So if you if I had to choose a team, it's uh, it's probably AC Milan. One of my best friends is Bobo Vieri. I talk to Bobo uh, quite often. I work with him at BN Sports in the United States. Currently I am a analyst uh, after my playing and, and, and coaching career. So I'm doing every inter Miami game right now. I'm commentating Messi and company for Inter Miami because I live I live in Miami. But we, before talking about uh, football, I would like to have an overview from from uh, Europe of America because you are an European citizen. And what are the aspects uh, that you appreciate most of this country, and what uh, you would change from uh, Europe? Yeah, I mean, I, I I came through the Ajax system in Amsterdam one of the greatest producers of, of talent, although the last two years uh, is, hasn't been very good uh, for, for I my hope, own. I hope, I, I hope him. Yes. I love him. I love him. I love him. I love him. My he's, family. Yeah, he's, he's brilliant. He really is. So I came as a 21-year-old to the United States, and I was brought here by, by Renus Meagles when Pele put football first in the United States. And then Cruyff, uh, Beckenbauer, some of the great names were playing in the, in the NESL. And then you fast forward to the 94 World Cup, which was huge also for the United States. And then the start of MLS in 1996. And then the Beckham effect, which became the designated player, the DP player that now Inter Miami has two of them, Busquets and, and, and Messi, obviously. Um, so we have had a lot of big watershed moments, I think, uh, in the United States. And if you look at the latest data uh, in the top 20 wealthiest clubs in the world, uh, Inter Miami is number 17, valued at $1.2 billion dollars and they've only been in business for five years. So investment in MLS teams uh, for billionaires, which most of them are, is still uh, very good. And I've seen obviously a tremendous progress in the United States, player development. We have Weston McKinney, we have uh, Christian Pulisic, uh, we have Timothy Weah, 
Uh, we have players right now that start in the EPL for big teams. Uh, so we've done an incredible job in a very short amount of time because this league is barely 30 yards, years old to develop uh, some quality players that I think in the next World Cup in 2026 at home, I think the United States could go to a quarterfinal or maybe even a semifinal. And if you go back to my first year in 1979, only two Americans had to start. So only two Americans got a chance to play with Cruyff, with Beckenbauer, with Gerd Mueller, with some of the greatest, obviously, uh, in the world. So from a infrastructure, soccer-specific stadiums, better practice facilities, better coaching, uh, which still can get better, by the way, uh, better refereeing as well. So our all vertical integration, technically and tactically, organizationally, has really gone up, I would say, in the last uh, 10 years. And that's a great benefit to the investment of all the owners in the game of football. We have Copa America this summer. We have the FIFA Club World Cup in 25. We have the World Cup in 26. We have the Olympics in 27 which also now is big in soccer because all the superstars want to play now in the Olympics, like Mbappe, for instance. So a lot of eyes are on the United States and this league is just continuing to grow and, and, and get better. We have the Columbus crew in the final against Pachuca. So in our region, CONCACAF, Columbus crew is now uh, the best team, uh, which also has not happened for many years. So I'm very bullish on uh, American soccer due to European and South American influences, the South American players and the European know-how of some coaches, Wilfried Nancy, uh, for instance, at, at, at Columbus, obviously. Uh, and we've seen the likes of Donadoni also play in MLS in, in the early years. So there's some Italian influences as well. I'm so excited because uh, I receive uh, your your energy. <laughs> and the main, meanwhile, you anticipate a lot of my questions because in 1979 you arrive uh, in this uh, in this championship, but uh, MLS di didn't exist yet. What uh, convinced you to pursue this uh, this uh, in this adventure? It's like a pursuit of happiness, as a, as a song uh, Keith Cudi. <laughs> A well, quick story. In 1978, I played for the Dutch Olympic team. Yeah. And our coach got sick. So Rinus Migos, you know, the gr great total football, uh, Naranja Mechanica, Clockwork Orange, Ajax, 74 World Cup, Barcelona, Johan Cruyff. Rinus, Rinus, uh, Rinus Michaels, Rinus Michaels. Yes, Rinus Michaels to be probably one of the greatest coaches in in the same frame as Ancelotti and, and won a lot of things and we're flying from San Diego to New York and but, but before I, I, a small digression Jack Reynolds I would remember because not, no one every time quote Jack Reynolds in Ajax yeah yeah that's a very Jack good Reynolds. very you, you've done your research the first one the first one yes. Jack Reynolds yes in my very heart, good in my heart. and then and then Kovacs uh, was the next one, and then Migos really took it to the next uh, mm -hmm. next level in the 74 World Cup with the Dutch uh, national team. So we're flying from San Diego to New York to play the U.S. Olympic team, and we're flying over the Grand Canyon, and Rinus Migos, I'm, I'm like this, I'm 20 years old, and he goes to me, Thomas, what do you see? And the pilot just says, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're flying over the Grand Canyon. I'm going, oh my God, this country is beautiful. When I'm done with my studies in two months, I'm going to backpack through the United States. One month later, Thomas, I remember you liked the Grand Canyon. You remember in the airplane? I just signed for Los Angeles as the head coach. I need a cheap guy that can do all the running for Johan Cruyff. You have $1,000 a month. You have to split a car and an apartment. And I said, yes, I'm coming. And here I am, 45 years later, still in the United States. I, I, would, uh, I would like to 
to describe what was the movement, American football movement, before pre-World Cup 1994, because MLS didn't exist before World Cup in 1994. No. This was the, the, the point that changed the movement. Yes. I mean, there was a wild turning point in the, in the 60s and early 70s. They brought over whole teams to play in a competition here. I think even Fiorentina was part of that. Some English teams as well. And they had some decent crowds. Then in 75, they started the NASL, the North American Soccer League. And they, the New York Cosmos signed Pele in 75. Pele and Beckenbauer. And Beckenbauer. And uh, Carlos Alberto. And Johan Neskens. And the list goes on. Gerd Mueller, uh, Bernd Holzenbein, uh, the Elias Figueroa, the best in the world, were playing in the NESL. But it died after yeah. 10 years. And the owners realized that there was no TV contract where they could make money. It's so like Warner, Brothers, Warner Brothers Communication said, and they owned the New York Cosmos, forget it, guys. There's no money in football, in soccer. NESL died. I stayed because I love this country. I was a high school coach, college coach. And then the you had a vision. You had a vision. You had a vision. Yeah. And then the announcement of the 94 World Cup. And FIFA said, we will give you the 94 World Cup if you start a new professional league, which happened in 1996 after the World Cup, with only 12 teams. Fast forward from 96 to 2024, we have 30 teams. We have a healthy league. I do all the games for Inter Miami. Two weekends ago, we were in Kansas City, in Arrowhead Stadium, where the Kansas City Chiefs won the NFL Super Bowl. 72,000 people came to watch Messi. A week later, we play against New England in Boston. 65,000 people showed up. The biggest crowds ever. And I think that you have a before and after Pele, a before and after uh, Major League Soccer and Beckham. And there will be, 100 years from now, a before and after Leo Messi. What Messi is doing right now is, is incredible uh, in terms of jersey sales, in terms of social media, and in terms of the way he plays right now. El, El Pistolero scored a hat-trick in the last game. And had an assist. You know, and the MVP is Messi because he has five assists in one half in 45 minutes. It's exciting times in the United States. We've come a long way, but I think that a lot of spectators now are buying into it. It's the biggest youth sport in the United States because parents realize it's not as violent as American football. It's not as just standing there like baseball. All kids can play. Everybody makes mistakes. It doesn't cost, cost much. So it's the biggest youth sport in America. And that will continue to translate into producing exceptional players and growing our fan base as well, domestically, but also internationally. Because my friends in Portugal, in Italy, in Amsterdam are watching Inter Miami on Apple TV. You know, incredible. Your happiness, uh was uh, was coming uh, is coming to europe <laughs> but uh, i would like to go step by step because uh, before going in depth in the american movement if you want to spend some uh, some words for joe lobby your first president in lauderdale strikers i remember very well it was an in a big entrepreneur because uh, he, he acquired memphis the dolphins in baseball and then no, football in football, yeah, sorry for American, it. I American football. It, but uh, he had the vision to grow to, bo to both some big players, Gerard Mueller, Kubia, um, Kubia Mueller, and the other one that you have called before. So if you would like to, to divulge to our audience uh, this, uh, this figure of American history. Yeah, you, you got to give a, a few owners a lot of credit. And Joe Robbie was a visionary. He bought a small team in 75, 76 called the Miami Toros. Then he moved them from Miami to Fort Lauderdale. 
He then became also the, the owner of the Miami Dolphins. And back in those days, we only had the Dolphins and the Fort Lauderdale Strikers. And as you said, Gert Mueller, Bert Holzenbein, Elias Figueroa, Nene Kubias, some of the greatest players, Gordon Banks. Best, played, best. Played, George Best. George Best. I remember played, George Best. Played there as well. So Joe Robbie and the, the, the Hunt family, Lamar Hunt, that owns Dallas, um, but owns also some other teams, including the Kansas City Chiefs. It's very interesting. The, the three or four owners that are very active and, and, and started in soccer in the 70s or 80s are all owners that own NFL teams. The Hunt brothers own Kansas City Chiefs. Joe Robbie owned the Dolphins. Uh, Robert Kraft owned the New England Patriots and the New England Revolution, obviously. Um, Colorado Rapids is owned by Stan Kroenke, that also owns a team in the EPL. So you had people that had vision, people that were willing to spend money on this on this game and make it make it uh, uh, popular. Uh, so yes, a lot of credit has to go to uh, those owners that in the mid to late 70s said, I'm going to put my money there, not only because it's an interesting game, it's a foreign game, I don't really understand it, but we feel there might be a future because it is the biggest game outside the United States. Why can it not be a big game in, uh, in the US? And if you look at Miami right now, we have an NBA team, we have a hockey team, we have a football team, we have a baseball team, and we have a soccer team. And the soccer team is as successful as all the other big four other sports as well, which means, Joe Robbie, rest in peace. Thank you very much. Regarding Joe Robbie, could you explain to our audience that unusual fact, unusual particular, when he purchased or he moved the team to Minneapolis, such as in NBA, when you, you purchase a, franch a new franchise? Oh, what's that? Correct. What's that? His, in, in, towards the end of the NESL, the North American Soccer League, when things started to fall apart a little bit and owners were losing a lot of money, the indoor game, indoor soccer, all of a sudden became important. And Joe Robbie said in Minneapolis, which is, by the way, very cold, we can play indoors for five months and we can play outdoors so we can play year round and make more money. Very smart. But at the end, both the indoor and outdoor game in 85, 86 really went down. In particular, uh, when the big owners, Warner Brothers Communication, Madison Square Garden uh, were owners of, of the Washington Diplomats where I also played with Jorn Cruyff in 1980 in the Capitol, which was beautiful before I went to Fort Lauderdale, which was my third team in the NESL. But, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely, absolutely right. And then after your, after your career as a player, you started with the youth sector, in particular Houston, Houston, Houston Dy Dynamos, but also Pope John II. And uh, before this experience, I know that uh, doesn't, didn't exist any kind of youth sector, but there were, there were a college system or high school system. So which is the difference and uh, which was the evolution that uh, bring that brought uh, this um, yes. football uh, I mean, with the NESL, from, uh, from school system to a professional system? Correct. I mean, and, and, and obviously in, in 85, 86, there was no more professional soccer. I was still young. You know, I was about 28. I love this country. I uh, had play. I started in Los Angeles. Then I went to Washington, D.C. to play for the Diplomats. Then I played for the Fort Lauderdale Strikers. Joe Robbie, as you said, moved the team to Minneapolis. Then I got traded to Chicago Fire. Then I ended up in Houston. And then it was done. And I said, okay, what am I going to do? I have played the longest in Fort Lauderdale. That's where most of my friends are. I'm going back to Fort Lauderdale. I, I taught languages at Berlitz, German and Dutch. I opened a little soccer store. I became a high school coach. Then I became a college coach. 
Then I was the liaison for the Dutch national team in 94 World Cup. And then in 96, I became a coach in the first year of MLS for the Tampa Bay Mutiny. And I'm so glad I stayed because most international players went all back to their countries because there was no more money in soccer for a few years till the 94 World Cup and the start of MLS in 1996. Because moreover, I know very well that football was a, a game uh, for girls. So because guys, when we're, when we're young, were used to, to play basketball, baseball, or for, for football. So how do you manage these guys and how do you, did you convince them to play or to try to, to start with football? Because when you are young, the most important thing, the most important thing is enjoy. And not, uh, uh, and not, uh, and you don't think about uh, uh, work, uh, a future work for your life. No, and that's a great, uh, that's a great question. Uh, uh, obviously, I, I think it started with um, the grassroots level, where a lot of kids, as I said again, even 30 years ago, soccer was the biggest youth sport till high school, because in high school, the better athletes have to make a decision because in high school, there's a soccer team, there's an American football team, there's a baseball team, there's a basketball team. And most of the better athletes that were very good at soccer ended up playing basketball, ended up playing football. So although it was a very big sport from ages six through 14, in, in high school, those numbers dropped dramatically. Over time, we were able to convince those great athletes. And now we're talking about inner city black players, which are incredible athletes that you see in American football, in basketball. And we always were brainstorming, how can we get Michael Jordan, LeBron James to play Calcio, to play football, you know? And now slowly we're getting there. Look at Weston McKinney, who's African-American. Uh, look at Musa, who's African-American. So yeah, a lot yeah. of the African-Americans somewhere when MLS started and they finally had a pro league where they could make a living and they finally got some heroes in Clint Dempsey, Landon Donovan, and all of a sudden young I kids were dreaming, I appreciate were dreaming about wanting to play for the United States in, in the World Cup. And, and it's been just a beautiful groundswell initially and as i said again look at now 30 teams uh, five teams in the top 20 uh, richest teams in the world we've come a long long way in a short amount of time and we only can get better uh, quite frankly but the ability for us people like myself to put an arm around a player when he was 12 years old and say you're pretty good basketball you're pretty good football but soccer Calcio, that's your future. Yeah, and they go, really, coach? So now you see more and more kids choosing soccer on an older age as well. And also, we have thousands of universities that give scholarships. So when you go to a university and you're a very good athlete, you're a very good soccer player, and you go to UCLA, where it costs $50,000 to go to school, But when you get a scholarship, they pay for everything because you play in the soccer team and you're a recruited guy. So a lot of parents and a lot of players became smart to say, hey, that's another sport I could go to college for. And my parents don't have to pay so much money because I'm an exceptional soccer player. So all these little things helped to raise the level and awareness in the United States. You have talked about Michael Jordan and they know very well his love also for baseball. And he also, his career is a crossover between basketball and baseball. The talent... Right. The, the best one, though, is Dion, the talent Dion came Sanders. Out, the, his talent came out in basketball, but was so talented also in baseball. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. remember Dion, Dion Sanders? Dion Don't Sanders played in one day... Major League Baseball hit a home run and then was a uh, right receiver for the Washington uh, Redskins. He's unbelievable. Bo Jackson. Bo Jackson, another one. 
I know, I know, yeah. I have seen Last Dance, his uh, film. So, yeah. and then uh, regarding uh, Yacht Sector and Kids, uh, how did you introduce uh, tactics and rules uh, uh, during high school system? So, for turning a uh, school system in a professional system, because if you have to, to play in a, a, foot, a professional game, it's important to respect rules, distance between players, and also uh, you have to to create a collective, not uh, an individual player, but uh, a player that uh, is inside and uh, taking account is uh, is uh, playmates. Yeah, yeah all, I think all relationships are based on trust, respect, uh, but also being creative. I mean, I'm from Holland, you know? We are a small country. We are below sea level. So to survive, we have to be creative. Boulder culture, and, Boulder culture, Boulder culture. There you go. So my coaching and playing philosophy is steeped in, in the Dutch total system. So Johan Cruyff said to me one day, I'd rather lose 5-4, lose 5-4, than win one nothing. Boring, no good. We have to entertain the fans. Uh, so that became uh, important uh, as well outside of obviously building a, a structure that you can build on and then applying your tactics based on the skill set of your players, you know. So I always chose, if you look at my teams, we always score a lot of goals with the Tampa Bay Mutiny, with DC United when I won a trophy in 1999. We were the best team in terms of scoring goals. So we always, I always felt we need to entertain in order to bring fans to the stadium. So that was very important. So I always looked at creative players. I looked at problem players, because a lot of times the problem players from the barrio, from the streets, they're the best players. But now you got to make sure that they understand player. that they got to buy into the team, the team, yeah, from the favela, you know, they got to buy into the team concept as well. So um, in saying that, because of all the other sports in this country, and this country is obviously incredible in all the different sports they play. All young kids, regardless of what sport they play, they have already a structure in, in club. They have a structure in middle school. They have a structure in high school uh, where there's great coaches and there's a team uh, setting uh, first and, 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 and foremost. And then you create a culture uh, where, where, where players push themselves and you know, are willing to die. Yeah, you know, I'm very emotional. But my players, they say, Coach, I'm going to run through that wall for you. Well done. Let's go. Vamos. No, no, I understand your reasoning because practically you, you say that we don't have to create a cage for talent. Talent has to be free. Yeah, it's clear. It's clear. But uh, regarding uh, always uh, that time, uh, we know very well when you defeat a uh, uh, national team 2-0 with the Plantation Eagles. A curious fact, because uh, with a crew of guys, you, you defeat the national team. How was, uh, how, how was happening, <laughs> this kind that of thing? Um, in the U.S., there's a lot of clubs. And our biggest problem in the U.S. is we have a system it called play, uh, pay to play. It's not free. The only kids that play for free are the kids that play for the academy of the MLS teams. So the kids of Inter Miami, they get free. But we have 1.2 million soccer players in South Florida. They play also for clubs, but they have to pay to play. And in, in terms of, 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 of youth soccer, when I had to work and get some money, well, there's no pro league. I became a technical director of a youth club called, called Plantation Eagles. And we had a under 19 and under 21 team. And I took my under 21 team with a few guys from the outside that were pretty good. And we beat the national team in Lockhart Stadium where Inter Miami is playing right now. It's the same stadium, although it's nicer now, which is really, really cool. Yeah. Every time when you come back to the stadium, you remember these uh, these facts, probably. Oh, I played. 
And I played there for three years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My roommate, my roommate was Gert Mueller on the on the road because I spoke German. He speaks Deutsch, my friend. And Gert Mueller didn't want to talk English, so he said, "Yeah, you you Dutch, you speak German, you are my roommate." Rest in peace. Also, I mean, yeah. I was ten years younger than most of those players, but oh, some of them have passed. Obviously, Wim Suvier, Jan Cruyff, Jan van Beveren. Very, very sad. Gerd Mueller. France, Bernd Holzenbein. Kaiser. Bernd, Kaiser. Yeah. Bernd Holzenbein. Uh, Der Kaiser. Franz Beckenbauer. Um, so that's obviously, yeah, that's part of life. But those were wonderful experiences, no doubt about it. Playing there in that stadium. Also 20,000 people, um, you know, playing against the Cosmos and playing with my heroes like Cruyff and, and, and others. Then after your experience in Yacht Sector, you had, the, you had the opportunity to come back to your team, Louder Strikers, and you won at first shot the championship against Nomad Soccer Clubs. What, Very good. What, what were the memories? What were the memories? Because uh, it's a strange fact. Bro, it's unbelievable. 86. When the NESL, so the big money guys, it collapsed. There were some people that were trying to bring professional soccer back. So we had an owner that said, hey, let's bring back the Fort Lauderdale Strikers with somebody in Boston and, and, and stuff like that. There wasn't a lot of money in that. But yes, that year we won in uh, San Francisco playing against the San Diego Nomads in the final. And we won 3-1 uh, uh, with Eric Eichmann scoring a goal. He played for the U.S. in the 90. World Cup in Italy. Uh, I had Neil Cavone, who also was part of the U.S. team that, that drew Italy, you remember? 1-1. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then later, I bring Walter Zenga to the New England Revolution. And Walter Zenga in 90, oh my God, don't talk about it. Uh, <laughs> Walter Zenga was in goal, obviously. I know very well, uh, goalkeeper, fantastic goalkeeper. Yeah. I bring him to the United States for, for two years, Boston, New England Revolution. Now in Saudi Arabian, Saudi Arabian Championship. He yeah, is, making uh, some, uh, <laughs> <laughs> some money. He's, he's earning a lot of money, but uh, I don't want to... He was, he was great for the team. Make in, in his shoes, I don't want to make in his shoes. A personal, no, no, no. personal decision. And how did you celebrate this achievement? Because in Italy, you know very well we are... So joyful when we won a championship. There is an uncovered bus that go around the city. So in America, how did you use to celebrate the, the, the championship winning? Yeah, a little bit different, obviously, because we, we don't have the history that you have in, in Italy. You don't have, um, you know, relegation and promotion. Yeah, we're, we're another, cities, fact, another topic like, that we like. Whole cities that win a championship, or whole cities that promote get promoted. The whole city goes out and celebrates for two days. We don't have that history. Yes, we celebrate. Yes, we have a, a few drinks, but mm -hmm. not like in 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 Europe that we see obviously after Inter Milan. You know, the whole city goes crazy, or 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 Napoli. You know, a few People. years ago. Or even Atalanta now maybe winning the U Europa uh, Cup, although Leverkusen probably will win it. But yes, the celebration was 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 different. The celebration was done within the team, but not necessarily the city, because it's not like the Fort Lauderdale Strikers are from 1891. No, <laughs> they're not that old, as we have the culture and the history in uh, in in Europe, obviously, where the passion of every person in the city is their team. And if their team wins, we celebrate for days. We go crazy. Not, not as much in the United States. Arriving at this, at this point, I would remember also that you were awarded as, as coach of the year in 1919. A great accolade for your work, for your work. a great accolade. Yes, I, I studied. Great recognition, recognition for your work. You were very I, I studied. There's four institutes in the Netherlands called 
um, central institutes of creating sports leaders. It's a master's program, it's four years, I finished that. So I really am a teacher, first and foremost. If I would have stayed in the Netherlands, I would have taught somewhere in school. Um, and my speciality was obviously in, in football, in calcio, in, 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 in soccer. So I already had a very good background in coaching methodology and, and, and things like that. So in the first year in MLS, when I became coach of the year, it was very, very special, obviously. And it also allowed me, because I signed one year, to go somewhere else now. Because all of a sudden, ooh, who's Thomas Rungen? He's the coach of the year. So I, I had New York wanted me and Boston wanted me. And I ended up the next year going to Boston for two years. That's where I brought Walter Zenga in 97, 98. And then I went to Washington, D.C., uh, D.C. United, where in 99 I won a championship. And then I coached. Uh, Chivas USA. I've coached four MLS teams, and now I'm, you know, I'm doing commentating for CBS Champions League, and I do Inter Miami as a, also as a commentator. But yeah, those are special, special moments because you work your whole life to accomplish those goals to become a champion as a player or as a coach, and in particular as a coach, it's very rewarding leading a group of 22 men into battle every time and winning those battles and eventually winning the war and eventually lifting the trophy. That's, that's pretty cool. No, no, I, I understand your emotions because you are solo. You are solo during this travel uh, of, uh, as a coach. But uh, at the same time, I would like to say congratulations because you don't forget your origins because at the same time, you accept another commitment in the Nova Southeastern University at the same time. And how did you merge uh, these, uh, these two activities? Totally different. Uh, it, what, when, coaching when, again, a professional team at the same time, developing a uh, young sector system. Always. Yeah, I mean, I was developing my skill set as a, as a trainer, as a coach. And when there was no professional league, I was a coach of youth players. I coached 10-year-old girls and 10-year-old boys. Then I coached in high school. Then I went to college. And the only thing I did was I tried to prepare myself for the highest level. And finally, I got the chance in 1996 to become the head coach of the Tampa Bay Mutiny with Carlos Alpibe Valderrama from Colombia. Oh, and I had Italian player. Beppe Galdarisi. Beppe Galdarisi played for me in 1996. I don't remember this player. I... He, pl he played with Alexi Lalas in... Uh... Alexi Lalas in Padova, in Padova, I know. Alexi Lalas, I remember very well. Because and Beppe of... played in Padova as well. Ah, because... And he wanted to come to the US. So I said, okay, we make a deal here. And Beppe Galdarisi was very good with Carlos Valderrama. So, you know... So I was preparing myself for the highest level, coaching high school, college, and youth. So when I would get there, I, I was ready. And then I would like to remember another huge result when you became a Yacht uh, national coach of American Sub-20 from 2001, 2000, 20, uh, 20, 2010. So... Uh, Probably you have seen a lot of young players, talented. I would like uh, to know which was the best one, according to you. Well, that's um, interesting. My first World Cup was in 2003. I will name a the... few. I will name a few. I will name a few. One, Fred Diadu. Yeah, yeah. In, 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 <laughs> in, in 2003, the World Cup was in the United Emirates. And we lost in the quarterfinals against Argentina and Tevez. Tevez was on the on on the team. And Tevez, we were up one nothing, 94th minute. Tevez to Macherano, Macherano header, and we lose in penalties. So I say Tevez was the best player. 205, Netherlands, our first game against Argentina. Messi on the bench. 
Messi comes in. We beat Argentina 1-0, but we lose against Italy in the round of 16 in 205 on the 20 World Cup. I say Messi and Argentina won, won, the, uh, won the trophy. 207, Canada. We beat Brazil with Marcelo, with David Luiz, with... 3-1, Freddy Adu, Josie Altador. Freddy Adu, so talented in Benfica and Monaco. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know which is the reason about... Uh, and this. then we beat Uruguay with Cavani and Luis Suarez and Michael Bradley, who played for Roma. Yeah, Michael the, pillars, Bradley, the pillars of the World Cup. The pillars of he the scored, He scored the winner in the, in the World Cup in 2007. And then my last World Cup was... Two or nine in, in, in Egypt. So, yes, I've seen some of the greatest talents around the world. I was the assistant coach in the 98 World Cup in France. I was the head coach of the Olympic team of the US in Beijing. Uh, so, I've seen a lot and I've done a lot. And I'm very proud to say that I, I love every minute of it. Maybe my most rewarding, because I'm a teacher, was the under 20 team working with special talent, 16, 17, 18, 19-year-olds, and pushing them to the senior national team, to the real World Cup. That, that's great, because I'm a teacher. I love that. Because about uh, Freddy Adu, he got lost during his career. What's happened, according to you? Oh, you said, you I, I remember you in 207, he scored against Brazil. He scored a hat-trick against Poland. And after the tournament, Michael Bradley... Uh, Robbie Rogers, Sal Zisso, one other guy gets signed to go to the Netherlands, to go to um, Germany. So they're 18 years old. And Freddie's agent, Freddie's agent said, Benfica, they want to spend $5 million. dollars. And I said to his agent, he's not ready for Benfica. Let him start with a smaller club, maybe in Holland, because that's where they're good technique. And then you make the step and make more money. No, 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 no. I want the money. He went to Benfica, which is a big institution, new coach, loan, 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 play for 20 clubs. And I still talk to Freddie. Very sad story because he was very talented. Yeah, yeah. Well, about Benfica recently, we have the opportunity to talk about uh, uh, talk about with uh, Renato Paiva, a young sector uh, coach. And uh, remaining uh, about winning on uh, Michael Bradley, I can uh, forget Zori Altidor, another pillar of national team, the best striker probably of national team. And you have the opportunity to see them in uh, Toronto together when you were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah like, very when special. You, when you were working uh, in Toronto. Yeah, I, I worked with my first under 20, Lennon Donovan, the Marcus Beasley. Clint Dempsey played for me, my under 20. Josie Altidore for my under 20. Awesome. Michael Bradley. So I'm very pleased that I helped a little bit in their development so they become icons for the U.S. men's national team and were able to go to Europe like Clint Dempsey. Clint you know, and, and, yeah, I can't forget and, him. Clint Fulham. Fulham, yes. Being uh, my mind in a facility, that are the state of art in America. How did you improve uh, this aspect about infrastructure, field, pitch, uh, academy? How did you improve uh, this aspect? Because it's related to, to investments, but also yeah, with, I media, mean, with media. Because if you don't have media or you have a system behind uh, behind this process, it's, uh, it's not enough to, to invest. In no, you see that for... Most clubs in MLS, the academy director uh, is from Europe or South America. So they have already, for years, they know how to develop players. And then they put a curriculum together that fits with the style of the team or the city. Like in Boston, they're a little tougher. In Los Angeles, they're more creative because there's more flair in South America. In Chicago, you got also tough guys. You go to Miami, because of the weather, you play on the ground. So it's very interesting to see that from different parts of the United States, there's different styles of play based on social, economic, 
and climatic uh, differences as well. You go to Chicago, it rains all the time. So you have to play balls in the air because the water on the field, you can't play on the ground. In LA, Miami, no rain. You can always play on, on the ground as well. So it's just beautiful to see that uh, through uh, the different cultures and the different geographical areas that you see certain players with certain traits come from. I can see a player for five minutes and go, okay, he's from New York. He's uh, probably from Los Angeles or Miami. He from Minneapolis uh, because he's crazy. He just, just runs. So, but that also, we you call the United States the melting pot where all cultures come together. And eventually, if all these cultures come together and we can make it a soccer team with <laughs> Latin, with Latin flair, with African-American players, with white players who are tough in the back, we could be, in 10 years, a very special team for many years to come because there is talent in the United States. There's no doubt about it. Right, your promise. Last two questions. Did you get the opportunity, did you get to know people who found the MLS, such as Ivan Gazidis, that recently was the CEO of Milan, but we know very well that he was one of the founder of MLS. Did you get to know him? In 1995, Sunil Gulati, uh, who was the MLS commissioner and also then became the president of the United States Soccer Federation, and Ivan Gazidis, they called me. They said, Thomas, you know a lot of players. You have to travel with us. We go to South America. We're going to sign 10 players. This was in 1994 for MLS in 1996. So we signed Valderrama, Jorge Campos. We went to, I went to Europe with Ivan Gazidis, to England and to Italy. We bring Donadoni. We bring, I was all part of that because I speak five languages, which is good as well. And Ivan Gazidis and I are still very, very close. Obviously, had a great career uh, with Arsenal and then went uh, to Italy as well. Sharp guy from South Africa, English taught, very educated. Uh, yes. The last one, if you want to spend a few words about this uh, film, as we can, about the Samoa American Football National Team. Because this is a curious fact that, that you, beca you became a Samoa uh, National Team uh, coach. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little journey here. Yeah. yeah. You, you, you made a, a, a journey. All right. Thomas Rongen, when he was little. Yeah. Thomas Rongen, LA. Thomas Rongen with Cruyff. Cruyff, you 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 Thomas move the, you move the camera well. You move the camera well with because you move you center the camera on the picture because yeah 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 now it's it's perfect. Yeah hey. yeah. Repeat, repeat the repeat the, the Thomas Rongen process. with Pele. Thomas Pele. Rongen with Cruyff. Yeah. Thomas Rongen with. LAS, Thomas Rongen with Diego Maradona. Wow, wow, amazing. Thomas Rongen with George Best. Wow. Thomas Rongen wow. winning a championship. Thomas Rongen lifting the trophy. Ooh, the MLS. And then the big movie, Next Goal Wins. Next Goal Wins, yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, if you want to talk uh, about uh, this, uh, this movie. Well... You it was a if you not you, I don't want to to no, 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 no. the final. It was, a, Just the... it was a it was a documentary in 2014 that was turned by Disney into a movie. Taiki Watiti, who won an Oscar for Jojo Rabbit, and Michael Fassbender is playing me in the movie. You can see it wherever you want. You can rent it from. 199. So my life has been pretty, uh, pretty uh, special. You know, <laughs> if they make a movie about you, it's pretty good. So, coach, I can uh, discover a lot about your career, your life. Now it's enough. I don't want to. Tommaso, I have one question for you. Hmm. Yeah. How old are you? I'm uh, 26 years old. I'm not. Your knowledge about the history of the game for very young 
No, I'm 26 years old. I'm not a professional journalist. I'm 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 only a fan, a supporter of the football in general. I I respect any journalist or somebody like you that does their research. Good questions. You looked at my history. I really respect that, uh, Tommaso. Thank you very much. Ciao Thank bella, eh? ciao bella, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Have a nice day. The same name, Thomas Tommaso. Fantastic. Si, 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 si. <laughs> kiss, kiss. I hope to have you again, probably when Inter Miami raise the, the There cap. you go. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye ciao. Bye. Se desideri continuare a sintonizzarti assieme a noi su Frequenze Calcistiche Estere, supportaci con un bel like ed un'iscrizione al nostro canale.